hour, so I had, uh, had to, I didn't shorten my bio at all, I guess. <laughs> Thanks. <clears throat> well, they, uh, about, gosh, it must have been eight months ago, I was asked to talk here at the grazing conference about firewood management, and actually, I was sitting at a technical committee meeting here at the NRCS office, and I saw the agenda come around, my name was on it. So, um, uh, I, I figure uh, they put me near the end because everyone might be tired of talking about grass or something. But, uh, but firewood production is something that uh, a lot of people do, and a lot of, you know, some people a day that they cut, and some people just use it in their home. Uh, we were, I'm going to talk a little bit about a project that is going. And and then just to talk. So that's how I'm going to approach this. So I'm going to talk about this project called the Friends of Firewood, and then uh, go into some of these other topics uh, related to consumers and producers of firewood. And I think I'm the one. over here. So, when I was growing up, I grew up in California, like uh, Steve Tony, I was my first degree, came out of Cal Poly San Luis Obispo on the coast, slow town. And, uh, uh, but we'd travel back to where my dad's uh, from in Kansas and then go up to Wisconsin where my mom's from, you know, before the interstates or as they were being built. Uh, in the back of a station wagon. And I remember from my grandpa Deschner's uh, house, he was uh, a caretaker at a Boy Scout camp on a lake. So he had heads and skins and furs and things. And these little dads, was this uh, saying, this old adage, you know, actually this is to chop their own wood or twice warm. Always was kind of an interesting thought, and uh, fires have all always been rolling. I was even out in California, so where I grew up. We there, and so we always bought like a cord of wood every year that someone would cut out of the the coast ranges there, just above the San Jose Valley, Santa Clara Valley. So, burn uh, it at home. I love it. you know as long as I. Can area kind of clean, my wife puts up with it. Um, but we've seen this, uh, oh, hmm, had some problem with animations if you don't really put them in there. <laughs> um, recently we've seen posters like this, this poster, a lot, just as a service and it's really um, in response to it came out in response to the emerald ash borer, an invasive pest here that is, uh, has wiped out a lot of ash trees in, um, in different states now. And it's probably to spread. We have it here in our state. Uh, but this is one of the out, and it uh, struck me for a lot of reasons. Very effective poster. Don't move firewood, the firewood's all burning, right? And, uh, and then, forget about what all this says, but you come to this picture and you have this pickup truck with this kind of nasty looking load of firewood, really, for those of you who burn firewood and like, you know, can appreciate good firewood. Nasty looking load of firewood. And then you got uh, right up here, right next to the guy's lunch bucket, or guy or gal's lunch bucket, this old grub, right? Pretty kind of, it captures your attention. Right? Don't move it from where? And so, kind of, you know, got under my skin a little bit because, again, I uh, appreciate firewood as a very productive endeavor. And so, we put together a uh, project. I don't know why are all these dogs. <laughs> Animations came from. But anyway, so, so, so. Uh, from the kind of the forestry side is that you know, firefighters are the first line of defense against some of these forest insects. Um, at the same time, it's important because 
important as a, as a financial input for a lot of people here in West Virginia. Uh, but at the same time, this firewood industry is mostly undocumented. In fact, when we started talking about doing some research with the firewood industry, you know, certain, certain of our colleagues and certain you know, agency people said, well, if you want to find out about firewood, go down to Charleston, apparently down on 190. People who line up trailers and sell it right by the side of the road. And, you know, they said they won't want to have it. You know, and so, uh, so we, we uh, proposed this project uh, called the Friends of Firewood. You know, we wanted to put a positive spin on things because, like just mentioned, it's a great industry, even if you're doing it as a hobby industry. Uh, and so we wanted to take a proactive approach before, you know, before maybe some type of regulation would come down and be put on, you know, firewood producers uh, population. And so, so we created this thing called the Friends of Firewood we, uh, we, in association with the West Virginia Division of Forestry, Randy Dye, the state forest. We put a project into something called, you know, something called the Redesign for Stewardship Program. And so the proposal is competitive and expanded. As a grad student I hired on for this project, she's a coordinator um, of this and is doing most of the work. And she's actually, her background is in, her bachelor's degree is in studio art that she got from Gettysburg uh, University, Pennsylvania. And so she designed our logo. Uh, among other things that I put her to work on, so um, so we're trying to spin this you know positive perspective of this of the firewood industry. Well, okay. Uh, so the purpose of this firewood uh, network is for, first what it's not. It's not really geared to, or toward any kind of regulation of firewood. In fact, you know, voluntary best practices are the kind of the best approach to any management of any type of industry. Uh, you know, I believe, and especially for this industry, because it is so, it can be so informal. Um, and then uh, what we focus on are two, one, firewood best management practices that I'll talk to you a little bit later, and then education outreach. Those are two primary parts. Uh, so we have three components. Uh, survey firewood producers to learn about educational workshops to promote those producers. They uh, develop a network of producers so they can uh, learn and come together. If so the first part of that was to uh, catalog or to contact our father about that. Well, you can imagine it's kind of a tough thing, you know, because the country of fire people is the state. You know, we really don't have and so we propose to work with our division of forestry foresters because we find a lot of these advertisements up on some tree or says firewood for sale, right? And phone number. So we worked with them to try to get a bunch of phone numbers, and then our first contact with firewood producers would be to, to make a telephone call. Uh, but we found that that process wasn't as efficient as we could. So we went to some other sources like planned on before too, but uh, uh, like the Craigslist and the uh, Mountain Trader type uh, newspaper where um, firewood is produced low or advertised locally. And so uh, we had some pretty good um, these surveys was to practices do these firewood producers carry out, you know, stocking, distribution, or a load from loggers, or buy a load of pulpwood from loggers, then they buck it up, and then, you know, distribute it, split it. We wanted to find out kind of the, the range of activities of the I also wanted to ask the knowledge about the species, as part of their business practices. We were looking, we asked them if they could divide different topics into 
give them an open-ended opportunity to answer that. Well, okay, I'll start on there. There's some more data. Our survey, we, we eventually wound up with over 400, almost uh, eight contacts, and that we, were, we made telephone interviews with. And uh, February, I don't have the exact results, but positive calls with our producers. And Say, we want to give you a short on the telephone, about five questions. And the last question, to fill out a mail questionnaire, because those questionnaires have more detail. So we did, so we did that as well. And, and uh, now we have, well, it says uh, 23 full response, but I know we've broken 30, which is not a, a large population, but we're pretty happy with that. Um, just, again, because a lot of these people probably would rather Tell us on the phone. Some people want to be, uh, and some of us, uh, but not allowed. Agreed to. Okay, had some. Found out that some of those phone numbers, the people were not selling. People um, also it was a thing, like they had a lot of a bunch of wood out there they wanted to sell. And, um, and then no contacts. In today's world of cell phones, it seems like phone numbers can turn over pretty quickly. Then we have the website I'll tell you a little bit about in a half a second. Here's the website. This is our Friends of Firewood web. In fact, we actually have a little uh, bumper sticker. The Friends of Firewood bumper sticker has the has this social network site under that if, he, if you ever uh, uh, get online. We, we we post pictures. This is a small web. This is a small social network. We really haven't begun our educational phase yet, where we're really reaching out to people to invite them into workshops and things. I really can't tell if this is. You know, is if I clicked it, clicked it, it's just going to take a long time. There we go. I think I missed one. Okay. So, okay. So so that's our. Project. I'm, doing a, I'm going to talk about some general ideas related to firewood now. And uh, first of all, is why you know why do people cut firewood? How many people in here are firewood users? Okay. Whoa. All right. How many of you how many of you cut your own wood? Okay. Good portion. How many of you sell sell wood? Liz Bash. Are, these are things that we will be working into our uh, workshop. Some of this, some of this information is important that firewood producers themselves are a good marketing approach. Um, how many of you, does anyone buy wood, buy firewood? Okay, a couple people. Uh, it's a great one. Not so great. If here and you just you know gave someone $120, you're not very satisfied. Reasons why reduce home heating costs. Most people uh, you have space heating um, function for stove in my largest room. It's a living room and it kind of uh, a, a larger area and definitely keeps the 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 gas heater from kicking on as much. Uh, again, reduce dependence on fossil fuels. Part anything we do at Woodlands uh, activities can be uh, sense of stewardship. So by heating the wood, hey, this is actually a good thing because it's 
uh, renewable and it's, it's a renewable fuel and it's uh, cutting our dependence on fossil fuels. We can use this, we can cut fire, which improves in our woods. And I'll get into that if I make it uh, a little later. Uh, we can sell it for extra income. Of you, or I don't know identify them. Uh, they can for extra income, but it's surprising on this, on this survey how many people say a portion of your total income comes from firewood sales. And, you know, the, the first answer is negative two, you know, because it is very intensive, work in, you know, intensive, equipment intensive, gas costs a lot. And, and we've talked to people who essentially do it as, a, as kind of out of a philanthropic they, they want to help their community, and uh, and so anyway, so yeah. and then family fun and exercise. In fact, the best that I buy from, uh, she comes with, and so it's definitely a family activity. Okay, so here is a. Uh, We've had a, a series of these firewood workshops before about six, seven years ago, and we talked about energy and the benefits of firewood and usually had like an outdoor stove dealer come in and talk about how sell. Things are changing all the time. Right now, the pellet market is huge, and pellet stoves are advancing all the time. We, we sell a lot of pellets in Europe, which is, they have um, higher regulations in terms of targets they're trying to, um, they're trying to hit like a 20% renewable fuels target uh, by, I don't know when, but, uh, but they use a lot of wood, a lot of bioenergy. Like the coal, the gas, they can't be replenished in Trees. When you think about it, a lot of our research at the university with respect to do with species that can be harvested and, and gener uh, burned to generate electricity. Thermal units, most of you are probably familiar with this amount of heat that's Required about one degree Fahrenheit, you know, across the ocean, and they switch is about 54. And uh, so, this is the main unit we, when we go and talk about different, the, the quality of different species for using as firewood, we use the BTU to talk about their heat, uh, how much heat they have. Okay, there's renewable, not renewable. I think I'm flipping through this too fast. Okay, so wood basically, review of what wood is, is um, it's mostly water. It can be It has organic compounds, uh, carbon, and ash. And these are kind of four basic categories we to talk about the composition of wood. It's important when we talk about when it burns. Uh, the the uh, stem itself, of course, is, is uh, we're all pretty much familiar with the stem of, I think this was, I forgot what that was. I'm not, I can't see the broad oak. Yeah, it's an oak. So that's oak. So we, okay, there's some main parts in here. The, the bark, of course, which is not that desirable, but it does burn. And then we have the wood inside of the bark, and that's broken into sap and heartwood. The pith is just the center of the, of the stem. Now I have that in there for, uh, for a number of different uh, reasons. The wood actually is just the vascular tissue of these trees. Right? Uh, but you know, we think of it as such a solid material. It's a solid that's made of all these little fibers, these cells. And uh, essentially what those do is they conduct water from the roots up into the crown. And uh, there's a whole other tissue 
that conducts the sugars down from the crown into the rest of the tree. Anyway, this is what contains the energy, the wood, right? Uh, this is what it looks like in softwoods, the, the conifers, the evergreens, the, the pines, spruces, firs, larches, very homogeneous with these uh, almost square cells aligned. And then we have, in the, most of the conifers, we have these resin canals, right? Because you go up to a fir and you can pop the little blisters on the edge. They have, uh, they have resin. Hardwoods, on the other hand, have a different type of cell structure, larger vessel elements that conduct, uh, that are largest in the early spring as the tree begins to grow and it conducts a lot of water up into the crown. And this pattern allows us to tell one species from another. We actually do a little workshop that a colleague of mine uh, go around. I think we, I don't know if we've been Randolph playing around. We've done that a couple of places around the state. You can actually tell the species of wood by looking at the cell structure. And, uh, all you have is a little uh, flake of it. Okay, so here's the cell, right? And this is where we're getting the end of the cell wall layers. And, uh, so those cell wall layers are made up of these bundles, uh, these cellulose bundles, right? We've all heard of cellulose. Uh, lignin is this compound that binds these bundles together, and hemicelluloses are uh, it, uh, in close association with these bundles in the connection with the lignins. So anyway, so at the basis of wood is just are these just these sugar molecules. Okay, so when we're burning wood, essentially we're burning sugars. Okay, so in the burning process, and again, you know, this is. Not critical that someone selling firewood knows this, but it's helpful whenever, I mean, I'm sold when, uh, I'll always remember when we were trying to get our, our house repointed. We have a, one of these brick four square houses that they bought in a Sears kit in 1928 or something, and they bring all the supplies and they just put it up and it's kind of standard. But this fellow came to my house and uh, I was a little apprehensive to this the first appointment. Open the door and he's standing there looking at my the stoop of my my doorway. He's going like this. I'm going, what, what are you doing? He goes, I'm just admiring this simulated granite. And he goes, you know, he says that. And uh, and then he goes on telling me like the fourth generation uh, uh, brick mason and his grandfather came over in from Italy and that these kinds of things. And he starts telling me about the brick and what all about it. I'm sold, you know. Uh, that he knows that kind of stuff. So it's important that people who are marketing this great product uh, know a little bit about this. So this is what I talk about. Anyway, we're all familiar with the fire triangle. Um, this is, these are the volatiles I was talking about earlier that uh, burn off the, the light that are released, and then we have this carbon remaining. The ash is another, boy, this is a sensitive one. The ash is another issue. You know, when you get firewood, uh, like locust will have some pretty thick bark, um, and, uh, and uh, chestnut oak can have some real thick bark. Bark has a 3% ash content. So you start burning a lot of bark, you have a lot of ash to clean up. And um, so ideally, you have thin, barks, thin bark on your, uh, on your chunk wood, and, or no bark. But, uh, but it's rare that you find that unless you have, unless you have a, um, wood, uh, someone sells wood that has a lot of standing dead wood where it's been standing long enough that the bark's had time to slough off. And you get that occasionally. Okay, this is a big uh, a, a key issue for anyone is how do we measure firewood and especially how do we measure firewood in a way that we know we're kind of getting a, uh, a half decent deal on things. Um, how many people have heard of a cord? what a chord is. How many people, if we gave them an exam, could tell me what a chord is? How many, how many could not tell me? Okay, a few. <laughs> so we've all heard of a chord. Well, I have it right up there, don't I? Uh, yeah, a chord is a, just a volume measurement for firewood in the United States. In Europe, they use a square, a cubic meter, okay? But, um, and they actually cut their lengths to one cubic meter, to, to, a, to a meter. Um, so a cord, obviously, uh, for those of you know, who know about it, is, is a, a stack that's eight feet long by four feet deep by four feet high. 
I think I have a picture here, and here's someone, one of these firewood producers, who wants to make sure his customers know, his or her customers know, what a cord is. And you'll meet these people. You'll, you'll meet people who just get really upset that other people, you know, they're selling a standard cord, and other people aren't. And uh, in some states, like New York, it's regulated. That is the unit of measure you sell wood by, and it has to be that. Here, mostly, we're getting pickup loads, right? Now, how much you sell? You know, how do you sell your wood? Well, we have a I'll give you, you know, sixty dollars load. And so it's no, it's there's no standardization here. In fact, in our in our regulations, it is written up that. Um, the, uh, the standard measure for firewood is a cord, but no one, no one, no one, uh, uh, re no one enforces that. Okay, so here's another one. Four feet, this is a split cord where you have uh, two four foot by four foot uh, uh, sections. And here's a load. I'm afraid to press this too hard. There we go. Here's a load I got yesterday. This is a load that came in a small pickup truck. I'll show you a picture of it later on, but um, that you can calculate. Here's a section that's four feet high, four feet wide, and it's about 18 inch average length. Um, and so that's a, a foot and a half. And this little section is only two feet high. You're missing a little space there, but so you have 24 face feet, 24 square, well, 24 cubic feet here, 12 cubic feet there, you add those together, it's 36 cubic feet, and there's 128 cubic feet per cord, right? Eight by four by four. And so this is about just over a quarter of a cord that came in a small pickup. So I paid, I paid $60 for it. Come on. I paid $60 for it, so it works out to about $213 a cord. Is that expensive? Yeah, yeah. How much does everyone pay for a cord of wood? 120. 120? Any others? What's that? I cut all you cut your own? Never buy any. Steve? I think 120 is good. 120 here in town? No, I'm east probably. Okay. Yeah, things vary a lot uh, depending on where you are. In fact, down in Beckley this year, we've talked. I talked to a firewood dealer or a firewood producer that um, hasn't sold a load yet. They had all these storms, and they so uh, all this varies by um, by area, and uh, and it also depends, is, is, you know, on how they how they process it, how long is the season. Uh, this is completely dry. It burns like it's uh, probably six percent moisture content, and um, in fact, uh, this little pile over here is two-year-old, and that, I can hardly stop the, the flu down enough to like keep it from just burning all, all burning up uh, you know, without leaving some coals that I like to keep. Okay, good reasons to heat with wood. This is what uh, a producer could use to market their product. Of course, it's renewable. We talked about. Carbon neutral, you all are probably familiar with carbon credits, right? You know, um, where um, when we drill uh, down in the ground, take gas out or coal out and burn that, it puts carbon in the air, doesn't put it back in. Uh, but when we cut a tree down and burn it, you know, replacing that tree in one way or another is technically sucking back that carbon that we uh, took in the first place and burned. Okay, you're in control, you know, you control how, how much wood you buy, what the type of wood, and, uh, uh, and the type of wood you use. Okay, no more freezing in the dark, right. How many, how many people had power outages this year? Yeah, lots of power outages and a lot of sad stories about you know, refrigerators, you know, going bad when, you know. When it was when it lasted too long, okay. No more freezing in the dark. Warm is like no other heat. You know, you know that. It's probably why you burn it. Uh, romantic, of course. I didn't put this. I got it off off the web. This list, but yeah, it's like uh, chestnuts roasting by the open fire, right? Ah, geez, I think. Okay, uh, 
makes you aware of energy. You know, you are loading that material in. It's not like it's coming through the pipes from the gas company and it's like you're paying in every month. You're constantly working with that, which is kind of one of the disadvantages. Uh, advantage or disadvantage, depending on you know, how, you, how you view it, because it takes work to, to keep it going. Uh, energy savings by space heating has been estimated to be about 25%. It's a way you are investing in your community. You're buying locally from someone who puts hard work into producing that. And uh, it can be cheaper than other uh, heat sources. Okay, some sources of firewood, if you're out looking, thinking about producing, and it sounds like, how many people said they cut their own wood? So most people here, most people, most people cut it for their own use. How many people cut it on your own property? Most people, I think I saw only one or two not. Okay, so most of you cut it on your own property, and, uh, but, but uh, uh, some, some, some people out there, um, wood to sell to firewood producers and some people who burn firewood actually have to go on other people's property to get it. And uh, those kind of relationships are built with you know, some of our they know people and they get people in touch with one another that because, because sometimes trees aren't that valuable, right? When a tree falls across your access road, you know, it's not that valuable. You'd rather have it out of there. But if you don't have the capability Cutting it and processing it, might as well have someone else do it. That's what happens a lot. Okay, so if you get it on your own, this is what you all are doing, right? You're fell, are, you, are most of you cutting down trees? How many people are cutting down trees? A couple people. Are, are the rest of you then processing trees that have fallen? Okay, great. So uh, you're bucking them, cutting them in sections, you're splitting. How many people have um, uh, gasoline-powered splitters? How many people split by hand? Good. How many people, and those, and uh, how many people have a, anyone have a manual splitter, like a foot-powered splitter? No, oh, that's okay. okay. Okay, so all these things you have to do if you're getting it on your own. For those who buy wood, well, there you go. For those who buy wood, everyone does the, everything but the felling, bucking, and splitting. Um, and they have to just store and, and use it. Yeah, here, so here's an example of you know, edu you know, one good reason for education and uh, planning a little bit. And um, we've all been in situations where we've been cutting a tree and it really doesn't want to go the way we want it to or it doesn't want to fall all the way down. All sorts of uh, issues associated with that, and and one of our motiv one of our um, yeah, motivations in this Friends of Firewood project is to get out and make sure every do everyone does have chainsaw safety training uh, and learns how to uh, cut trees down efficiently. Okay, so let's see here. Okay, so we talked a little bit about wood prices here, kind of in the in the audience, and uh, so why do they vary? Well. Energy content in different species varies. And so if you're a producer, it would behoove you to know how you're cutting rates. Uh, Osage Orange has one of the highest BTU amounts per cord, and others like the basswood have very low amounts. And so if you're a good marketer, a good uh, a producer who wants to like make the most from the from your the work that you're doing and you're in some Osage Orange, you want to try and get a premium for that. Not much Osage Orange. There's not too much. You find them scattered here or there. And in fact, uh, you know, I can count on you know when I, we like we we always pay attention to them because they're a cool species. Actually, over in the eastern Panhandle, there's some a couple uh, hedge rows of them, then, and they're probably more prominent over there. But here we have some. I got one right across town. got one down at Prickett's Fort. But it's, we have to know that because um, when you go out and teach students about you know, tree identification, that's a neat one to show them. Uh, wear your chains down. You know, I was, gonna buy, I, know, I was working with a guy in Pennsylvania to try and get a load of that. And uh, it just didn't work out. The timing didn't work out, but he had a full load of it. Yeah, he says, he says it's hard on the chains. 
Uh, anyway, location of your wood, you know, rural versus urban areas. If you can take firewood down to Washington, D.C. somehow, you get more money for it than you get around here. You're not going to get $120. You'll get more than $120 a quart, I'll tell you that. You get more than $200 a quart. So, um, so location is important. How dry is it? You know, you can always actually, if you're a producer, you can always sell wet wood to someone, but you probably, hopefully, won't sell it twice. Because, uh, because, or hopefully, people learn from, from, from errors. I mean, I do. I, I've bought a couple, I've purchased a couple bad loads of wood or, or wood that's been just completely outside of what I should have paid for it. So dryness is another factor. Okay. Uh, uh, piece size, uh, smaller size requires more processing. Our forestry club cuts wood on the research for on our research force, and they sell it. And this year they had a deal by this. Uh, well, I'm, I'm putting, there's a there's a company here in town that uses wood to fire an oven. And I mean, it's not. Uh, yeah, they're down here. This little grill or the the uh, pizza shop. Which direction are they? Right over here. Great little place. Uh, and they approached uh, the forestry club and said, you know, we, if you cut wood, you know, this long and split it this size, um, we'll, and it's only black, we'll pay you like $100 a truckload. And, um, and apparently, of course, the forestry club's kind of this mixture of, you know, who's the leader? Well, we'll do the firewood this year and you do it next year. And um, the fellow never called them back. And I didn't ask why they didn't call him back, but, uh, but he was going to pay more for that processed wood because it's nice, small little sticks that they control their, their oven heat. Um, so, so the uh, piece size um, is important. Uh, the amount you purchase, you can get more in bulk. Uh, the more you buy, uh, you all know these little packets they sell at the store. I don't know if I calculated that, but uh, I think I calculated that was over... Um, there was some European white birch, in fact, that was on the picture on the cover of the Friends of Firewood Network. That's selling for $8.99 for approximately, even if, it's, even if it's one cubic foot, right? One cubic foot times 128, it's like over $1,000 a cord. So, um, and, and then you pay for whether it's delivered or not. And not all our firewood producers deliver the wood. Some people have them come and pick it up on their properties. And here's, here's the kind of the final you know, message. They charge differently because they can. There's no standardization whatsoever in this industry, in, this, uh, in, in the firewood market. Okay, how do you know the wood's dry? All sorts of different uh, ways. Uh, you know, this end checking, uh, dry wood weighs less. Uh, two pieces banging together sound hollow. You've all worked with wood. Kind of, uh, and then uh, you, go, you go down to all these different uh, methods, and uh, I just use a moisture meter. You know, I'm a consumer, so I have my moisture meter at home. A truck pulls up. Usually, I buy it whatever, you know, no matter what, because uh, you can't really see down in the wood, and you know, you've already made this kind of verbal agreement to purchase wood. It's tough to turn up the fire dealer around once they get to the house, or it is for me at least, and. Uh, because usually the wood will burn no matter what. But uh, um, anyway, symptoms of wet wood, and this is this is again things that firewood producers should know when they're marketing their wood. Um, you know, we have the whole idea that you know firewood is going to build up a whole bunch of creosote in your in your chimney, and so it's something you really have to watch out for. And there's some products available in today's world that you can buy logs that puts this you know, acid up into your chimney and it kind of helps that creosote build up. It kind of hampers it a little bit. But you know, it's, still have to, it's still a good idea to you know, clean out your stove every year. Okay, I'm going to move right down through here. Okay, here. What is high quality firewood? And, and you all can add to my list here because uh, I've uh, I put this one together just because of some of the bad It lacks outward signs of decay, and so I think I have a picture of some fungus growing out of the wood. Does anyone have a lot of fungus on your wood? Do you, do you, do you screen for that, or does it matter to you? 
Any comments on that? Really? So what what is it that builds up about that? If you look, if there's holes in it, uh -huh. you have a bunch of little decay holes, particularly in uh, elm that's been down for a while, so it has a tight grain and it has these little holes. Huh. So it's hot burning wood, but it's hard to burn and get stuck on the bottom. And then as the ashes build up, it's hard to notice that you're grazing on and it can light up the, uh, you can start a chimney fire by letting, if you have a freestanding stove with an door unit. Uh -huh. And as that gets higher towards your stovepipe, it kind of increases your increase of build up and you might go through it. Hmm. Okay. Hadn't heard that one. We, we don't, oh, uh, yeah? I think the premium hardwood firewood is uh, having no bark. Having no bark, right. And, well, this, this piece doesn't have any bark, but it has fungus in it too, right? Fungus is just wood, you know? Certain species of fun, fungi get their energy from wood. Like, that's one of the things I do. I go talk about shiitake mushroom production, right? And we inoculate logs with shiitake spawn. The fungus grows out in the wood, consuming the energy in the wood. And as it does that, you know, of course, the wood gets punky and, and the energy in the wood kind of okay, So you have less energy. Uh, but we can't, I don't bring this in the house because, you know, certain fungi, certain people are allergic to fungi. You ever hear of mold allergies? In the spring, one of the things that hits a lot of people, I don't know if they you know, recognize that, it's, you know, it's warming up and there's fungi everywhere in our world, right? And it's starting to reproduce, put out spores, and, and uh, so we keep this type of thing out of our food Okay, so here's another Okay, moisture, uh, wood is dry, this is another, this is another um, high quality wood characteristic. Less than 20% moisture content, they, that's what they say. They say your wood has to be less than 20% moisture, ha have 20%, less than 20% moisture in it to be considered seasoned. And that's about just kind of the border, you know. I like to see mine down to 17 and 15% moisture content. And so how do you know that? You can get one of these moisture meters. I brought one here if anyone wants. How many people have ever used one of these? Anyone? It's interesting, especially if you're a purchaser of wood like I am, you can check it and if you get some wet wood, you know, you can set it there. I've put it under a fan before. We have this big carriage house that, where I store my wood. You can get a different quality. I think this one was like $160, but you can get them like for $75 to $80 for all it is across here, and you know, the more moisture, the faster the current, or something. It's all programmed to, to you know, show where that exists. So this one's down to 11 percent. I just got this load. This is no, this is the two-year-old wood. Actually, that you can see some uh, fungi around the, the outside of that one, kind of decomposing that wood. So not not the best piece, but that's old wood. So this is pretty dry. 11 percent. 11% moisture content. This one was sitting out in a wheelbarrow full of water from a rainstorm. You know, we wheel it up to the, the, the uh, door when I'm not at home and uh, my wife just goes down and picks it up there. Well, some rain came forth. She covered it covered up with so 25% moisture content there. Okay, a good species. Remember we talked about getting a premium for these different species. There's a list. Uh, you probably can't see it in the back of the room, but uh, this is Osage Orange again. Uh, 485, uh, 400, 4,800 pounds per cord, approximately about 30 million BTUs per cord. And uh, here's ironwood, which is a kind of a small tree, large shrub kind of plant. Uh, American persimmons, another high one. Shagbark hickories down 4,000 pounds per cord and 2,500 or 25 million uh, uh, BTUs. Drop all the way down. And I've, this is a appendage that we talked about uh, incomplete uh, table because there's a lot more species obviously in our area. But down here you look at basswood, a very light species. In fact, in Wisconsin they have a whole industry that revolves around that because people love to carve in it. It's great carving wood. Um, but that's 2,200 pounds nearly. It's you know, half the weight of the, of the um, Osage Orange and um, over half 
or you know, much less than half of the energy content. So very important, the type of wood. You know, it's nice to get some shagbark hickory. So I like getting a diversity of woods. Um, yeah, the, the, the yellow poplars, you know. The, um, what else do I get that's not so? Yellow poplar is one that shows up a, a lot, and you hope you don't see much of it in the load that's coming in. Unless you want ni nice, unless you want a bunch of you know quick burning fires that'll you know heat up in the morning and kind of die off quickly. Yeah, I don't think black were they. Let's see here. Uh, uh, okay, so uh, black. Uh, we got. We have a white oak here at the top of the oaks at about 3,900 pounds per cord. And there's another, yeah, red oak right there at about 3,500 pounds to, per cord. Yeah, cher cherry I didn't put it on. That's, that's a mid-range. That's in the mid-range because I took pretty much the top of this table and the bottom of the table with the familiar spaces. I chopped the middle out. So it sits in there. I burn a lot of black cherry. It's, just, it's a decent wood to burn. Okay, size to fit, fit your stove is another one that uh, if you are a producer, you may want to make sure you know what size your customer wants because this is, this is the result of having to, you know, all this debris in your garage, you have to get out there if you get too long of pieces, you know, and cut off the ends or split it again. So you want to get pretty consistently sized pieces. It's, it's horrible when you find at the end of the season you have a big stack of wood that's too long to fit in your stove. And so, you know, if you're producing, you want to, you know, a good size for me is about 18 inches, but um, I recognize that there are other people with you know, larger capacity. And, and uh, in fact, I gave a load away this year because it had a, it came on, kind of surprised me. It, was, it wasn't what I was expecting. It was a larger chunk size. The length was okay, but it was chunk sizes, you know, plus I had a bunch of fungus on the end, so I gave it to the people across the street, and uh, they have a bigger stove. Anyway, you can make a mess, and uh, you, know, you want to get the product you're buying. You want to get a good product. Okay, so, so size to fit stove is another one. Consistent volume, here's, my, here's one of my favorite producers. Uh, Isetta Dalton lives up the Kingwood Pike, and she comes every year with a, pick, or with a, a dump truck, and of course, uh, they weasel that thing on, I got a little wire there, and, she and her daughter and daughter-in-law uh, back it up, dump it down here. I, we have to, my son and I, or, or sometimes just me, I have to take a wheelbarrow and load it all into our carriage house up the, up the driveway a ways, but it's good exercise and it's a great load. Uh, she's one that takes, uh, buys pulp wood, lets it, lets it season out, just sitting in, in her yard, not her yard, she used to own a lumber yard. And, um, and then they split it when needed. So it comes in, the surface moisture is a little bit higher, but it always, it always seasons out like in, a, in about a week. It's very consistent, always good, has oak. This year I got a bunch of hickory in there, so um, it's, uh, she's like my favorite producer. <laughs> anyway, this is my second favorite producer. Uh, uh, he brings, a, this is the small load that I showed you yesterday. I got it yesterday, it's about 0.2 that I paid 60 bucks for, and, but it's super dry. He keeps it covered, he keeps it stacked, and, uh, and there's no question that that stuff's gonna burn when he brings it. So, so the consistent quality um, makes it important as a consumer, uh, you know, I'd rather pay a little bit more and get wood that's gonna burn rather than pay less and, and be suffering seeing the wood sizzle in my stove, you know. And that's my son helped me out too. Okay, specialty woods and services. Uh, you know, if you have a access to orchards, you know, they're pr always turning over different species of woods. Um, you know, these are specialty woods a lot of the time for barbecuing. My brother out in California is, you know, bent on getting almond wood this year because they're orchards out in California and they purchase that almond uh, wood and bring it into, into town and sell sell it to people who are barbecuing aficionados, right? Because it, it's, a, it's a good barbecue wood. Anyway, another specialty, another specialty uh, service, really, that firewood producers sometimes do is clear out the fence rows. Does anyone, are you all, you all have farmers have cattle? 
Well, my father-in-law raises a bunch of cattle down in uh, Russell County, Virginia, and they have different issues with vegetation, but I've met, I've met fire producers that are uh, clean out clean out the fence, fence lines just in exchange for the wood. I mean, the farmer, I don't think there's any cash exchange. I think the agreement is they clean it out, they get to keep the wood and sell it. So it seems like a pretty good deal to the, to the farmer because fence line maintenance is, is, is a lot. Okay. So this is one of the things that where, where you know, managing the wood lot can come in. You know, you've all probably heard of thinning of trees and woods, right? Crop tree management is one of these technologies that you know, we talk about with private woodland owners because it's a simple, easy to understand approach to managing a woodlot because it's done on the individual tree level. Um, this is the, usually the main product. If someone has a woodlot, you want high quality trees. Now, if you're in wildlife and you want some like bat roosts and things, that, then you want big cavities in your trees. But if you don't, if you want to make sure that you kind of had both, then you want to assure you have nice straight trees that don't have any kind of defects in them. Okay, this is what happens when you thin a tree. Uh, uh, this is a, these two trees were the same diameter. These are just sections out of the tree cookie. And uh, at 20, 26 years ago, they were all the same, same diameter, these two trees. This one, however, had all the trees around, of it, around it cut. So it was thinned and its acceleration of growth uh, it accelerated in growth uh, much over the one that was not thinned. Okay, so it's, it's amazing. You know, I used to work as a scientist at West Vega Corporation, and we go out and measure these thinning studies. And it's remarkable the amount of growth that can take place when you thin a tree. And it's a great investment in a, in a stand so that, you know, when a stand is 30, if you thin it at age 15, oftentimes it'll look like it's 45 years old. So it really makes a big difference, which we used to say, uh, you can expect uh, you know, about a 50% uh, increase in productivity of your stand if you thin early. But that's a key, getting it early. Okay, I'm going to move through this little quote. That's what it's about. Thinning early makes a big difference. Here's the idea of crop tree management. You go out and select your trees. You, know, you can have foresters help you out doing this because they know kind of the market value of certain trees. They know what can be sold, what can't be. They know the quality of the tree. They know how to spot defects that you might not be able to see. So we always re recommend working with a forester. But you can go out if you feel comfortable and identify certain trees. And then a crop tree thinning is just thinning all these trees around, around that crop tree. And that opens space up so its canopy can expand in that space. The more leaves it has, the more faster it's going to grow. And we can show all sorts of these. Uh, you know, different graphs showing that, you know, the number of sides of a tree you release, the number of sides of a crown, the more you release, the more it's going to grow. All right, well, there's a picture there. This is a, actually the crop tree demonstration area up at Cooper's Rock. This is probably in year 12. You know, they say that, you know, you look up after you thin a stand of trees or after you thin one of your crop trees, and if it looks just right, you probably haven't taken enough because trees grow back. They fill in that space, especially at a very young age. You know, when you have a stand of trees that are 15 years old, they're still growing. They're so, so anyway, uh, so this is what you don't want. This is what you don't want in a crop tree. All these different defects, lower live branches, sweep or curvature in the, in the stem, uh, bird pecks, fungal conks. If you see a conch on the outside of your uh, tree, that means fungus is inside consuming the wood. And then, of course, all the, you know, the barbed wire and things. No good. Cat faces or uh, hollow spots. And, uh, you know, there's a whole other side of the, uh, of the firewood production industry. They, they, there's all sorts of equipment out there to help the small-scale producer. A lot, of our, a lot of our firewood producers here in West Virginia we're finding are the smaller-scale producers. So, uh, they have these small little arches that will help you haul a log out. You hook it up to an ATV um, or, even, or a pickup. It will you know, allow you to pull a log out of the, of the log to get to play. Here's one of these you know, foot-powered splitters. Uh, and uh, here's, a, here's, a, here's a motorized wagon that allows you to transport heavy materials. And so, it, so fire production is a big issue. Uh, with, you know, for me, uh, being, uh, not getting any younger, 
you know, I can't haul my big bucket of wood in for many more years here, so I'm going to have to look for some alternative technology. Uh, Steve was telling me about something he uses uh, at his house. But, you know, all sorts of wheeled carts and ways to move this heavy equipment, equipment around. Uh, all the way up to, you know, a, a, a firewood processor that not only, you know, takes the log on a conveyor, you know, bucks it into sections, you know, chops it into sections, pushes it through a multiple um, uh, cutting head, produces, you know, six or eight pieces of firewood, and then, and then it goes up a conveyor and gets piled up, gets out of the way. So there's all sorts of ranges of equipment that's, that, are, that is set up for uh, firewood production. Okay, I passed out some of these information sheets. We're going to be kind of covering those in some of these upcoming workshops. And if anyone is interested, you know, feel free to, you know, go to the Friends of Firewood and share your experiences, you know, with firewood production. If you're a, a homeowner that, you know, cuts wood or has some good tips for other people, it's a small social network right now, but we hope as in the next uh, eight months it's going to be growing we go around to these workshops. So any questions? Oops. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay, so uh, I, I was showed you that cross section, right? You, you had the sap wood, right? And that sap wood actually just takes the moisture from the ground and conducts it. There's also a layer of tissue that called the phloem or inner bark that conducts the sugars down from the tree. And so you, if you go in an inch, if you take a chainsaw and go cut through the bark, and then in another inch, you will not only have cut the phloem tissue or that the vascular tissue that brings the sugars down, but you will have damaged some of the water conducting tissue. Now, if it, you might want to consider double girdling if you are um, working with like aspen trees. What's that? Oh, okay, oh, so you're uh, more uh, frilling it yeah. Yeah, going around. Yeah, so you're going to have to you know, chop the bark off, right? And then and if you chop the bark off, that, sh you know, and then go in another, you know, half inch, that should damage the tree. But uh, are you, what, what's the reason for girdling? Well, as you say, thinning some of these. Uh, right. Yeah. yeah. One, one of the, uh, a, a, a former colleague of mine is deceased now, uh, Clay Smith was a, was a uh, scientist over at the Ferno, and we were talking about, he'd done some girdling studies, and he goes, Dave, you know, what we found is, if you're going to girdle it, you might as well just cut it down, you know, because they're going to be standing there, and eventually, that's a weak spot, and they are going to fall, so at least you are controlling when those come down on the ground, so, um, yeah. And, and, and then if you just want, you know, there, there's also ways that you can, like, inject some her herbicide into it that would be very, much more effective. You know, some trees, especially the maples, I've seen, we've girdled those things, we put a bunch of herbicide into them, and there, some of them are really tough. And so, um, you know, herbicides can be really helpful if you're just trying to, you know, deaden a tree. And you asked of what, what species these are, well, and I brought a couple chunks in, in case you want to try my moisture meters. And uh, I have black cherry here and just a, a piece of black locust. One's wet, one's dry, I won't tell you which. But. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so when your tree comes down and, and, uh, and you want, you know, to start the rot of stuff, start the rot, you know, what would you recommend you use? I mean, certainly there's a plethora of things out there. Yeah. Scientifically, yeah. if we had a stump and we wanted it out of our yard, for example, yeah, really my wife good. would make me go get a a, a grinder. A grinder or yeah. an and I've done it. Out. So, and it's it's not easy. <laughs> well, yeah, I'm not sure what product to recommend. I know they sell different fungi, and and in fact, uh, we have another stump over in another property we are you know owe the bank for, and. Uh, uh, it, it was it's rotting out naturally, and it's pretty interesting. And one day I heard a pileated woodpecker in our neighborhood. I said, "That's a pileated woodpecker," oh, yeah, they and it came right. Uh, the next thing I know, it's coming down and bam, 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 pecking at whatever's down in there. So, and we didn't treat it with anything. So, um, I, I'm I'm really not familiar with kind of the efficiencies of the different products. Okay. 
Okay. Yeah, so I can't give what you a recommendation. What about when you cut a tree and you want to stop the uh, stuff? Yeah. Yeah, are you in the woods or near water? Uh, or just... uh, no, I'm in the woods. Okay. Yeah, if you want to stop, uh, you, can, you can cut the tree down, and as soon as you can afterwards, you want to take some, uh, just some Roundup type herbicide, you can apply it to the board or the, uh, the, uh, the portion of the stump around where I was talking about the, the, the uh, water and the, and, the, and the sugars flow just on the outside. Okay, good, yeah. Yeah, you want to put to that sapwood, you know, apply it to the sapwood because that's conducting still, and that'll suck it down in the roots. It should, should uh, solve that problem. Okay. You can also, you, I mean, you can also, if, even if you cut, do a stump treatment, you could probably still use like a, a, a Garlon type product, a triclopyr based product, which is, in, which is uh, in oil, which will move through the bark and kind of take care of it that way. Well, uh, triclopyr is an active ingredient for a compound that can be mixed with oil and goes through bark. So, yeah, and that's another way. You can actually, if you wanted to, you can treat a bark, you can treat bark of small trees with uh, oil-based herbicide and uh, allow it to, you know, sit there for two weeks and then cut the tree down. So you will have kind of poisoned it before you cut the tree down. Otherwise, you can just do a cut stump treatment to so cut the tree down and apply that like glyphosate based herbicide like Roundup. And what are you, what are you doing that for? Increasing pasture or? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh, the big ones, yeah. We were, we were when I was with West Vega, we were putting in experimental plantations. We were looking at the old fields, and we had to like pitch, you know, cut down these locust trees and take the tractor and back them up. And boy, you back those stuff up, and those roots just keep coming. <laughs> it's like those roots are like third. Push and push. Oh, big trees. Well, well, there's a lot of downward. I think we're. Do we have to get out of this room, or? I think we're good for 25 more minutes. Oh, oh okay. Um, uh, there's been a lot of blowdown lately, and we've had storms in the past. We had back in 2003. We had like 300,000 acres here in West Virginia severely damaged by ice, mostly in the mid part of the state, Gilmer County, I think Ritchie, you know, that whole zone in there in the western, and uh, people had a few years. I mean, it, it was good because, you know, as long as your stems are up off the ground, you can, they are not going to rot as fast. And so you can still process them. And uh, one, of the, one, of the, one of the things that people like to think about is asking a portable sawmill owner to come in on their property and so, so that they can at least use those boards. They wouldn't have to buy them. And so, I mean, so you might have a shed made out of black cherry or something, you know. <laughs> Unless you can, for the, for the, just for the white pine, but the white pine too, it makes a great wood, but a lot of times the white pine are planted like a, on the side. And so a lot of times the, the big old, the big white, oak, white pines also have big lower limbs and you don't have a very high quality stem. But as long as they're tight knots, you know, make barn, barn boards. Yeah, it's just amazing to me that there's so much, so many things out there that people just like sweat. Yeah, and, it, and in so fact, sweat. you know, and, and portable sawmilling is fun. We had, we had a, a grant uh, a few years ago to do these workshops around, I don't know if we, did we get over to Randolph? And uh, people love seeing those in action. And people just, you know, it's like, I want to get one of those. Uh, and it's not easy work, and, uh, but, it's, but it's super productive, and you'd be surprised. At these workshops, we have people bring logs in. One place over in Ritchie, when we were in Ritchie County, you know, I was, it was kind of a last minute thing, so I was calling this guy and saying, okay, who do I call to get some logs here? Because we hadn't got them by the time we were going to do the workshop. And so a, a, a company brought some over from the log yard, 
And they knew it was the best ones, and they were pretty ratty looking. But you'd be surprised at, you know, when you're doing custom sawing, when you're doing the cutting, how, how, uh, how much clear you can get out of it. They're not the long clear boards, but, you know, short sections that a woodworker or even a cabinet maker might be able to use. So, so, it, uh, so you can get high quality wood out of some pretty lousy stuff with portable sawing. Thanks for coming. Appreciate and, uh, it. We have a gift for Dr. McGill and, yeah. uh, from the West oh.